the taper. It's here. Woo! I'm so excited, aren't you, ladies and gentlemen? Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners, is excited. But as you may guess, probably not for the reasons that the mainstream media is and the general economic economist community. We're going to talk about it. We're going to go through four articles. Sorry, George, four, not three. Jeff, how are you doing? I'm good. You know, I'm, I, I wondered if we should maybe have our own tantrum since the market doesn't seem to want to. So maybe this is our, our version of a taper tantrum is to go through what the hell's going on with all this taper stuff. Taper tantrum. What is it all about? Ladies and gentlemen, as you can imagine, Jeff has been ahead of this. Um, what am I trying to say? Jeff has been ahead of this for years and he started, we're going to go back in time a couple of months and we're going to reference an article that he wrote on the 28th of July. It was posted at Alhambra Partners and it's called Tapering the Truth. Now, we're going to go through four articles so we don't have a lot of time in today's show to go in depth in each and every one. So Jeff, I'm just going to read some words that I highlighted and then you can tell us what it's about. Ceremony, ritual, faith, cult, rites, believe, conditioned, ceremony, ritual, theatrical, ceremony, cult. Jeff, basically, if the financial press says that a tree fell in the monetary woods, even though it didn't, it makes a sound, right? Yeah, and that's the point, isn't it? It's the, the idea that the Federal Reserve is everything. It's the center of our universe, and not just the financial investing universe, but the universe of the, the, the entire economy, the, all the, the entire financial system, the monetary system, of course, that's supposed to govern the entire economic system. And that's where really, it's the message you get from the very first time you take economics 101 in college, or even if you take a prerequisite course in high school, that's what they tell you. Central banks are central. And then every day of your adult life, that message is reinforced time it's unconsciously subconsciously in every kind of way through the financial media and even the mainstream when the mainstream media picks up on any kind of economic or financial topic who are they discussing it with they usually have some central banker or federal reserve chair on to give us give us their opinion about what we're supposed to think about what's happening and what the fed is doing because what the fed is doing again is the, is the message is reinforced over and over that's the only thing we're supposed to care about. We only care about what the Fed cares about, and it's just it's reinforced, it's shoved down your throat time and time again, everything you do. Here's a quote by you. It's a big deal for the financial channels and even for filling media page views. And it is, it's been in the news leading up to the announcement, after the announcement, every news story I've read this morning is, well, it's pre and post taper announcement. How is the world gonna function now? It didn't even matter how it worked before. We're in a whole new era. But Jeff, people may be wondering, well, what is, this should be, like the headline should be, taper tantrum two in space, no one can hear you scream or something like that. People have heard taper, but tantrums not being mentioned as often this, this time around. We're gonna talk about why that is by going to your second article, which you wrote about, you wrote on the 16th of August, it's at Alhambra Partners, and it's called Taper Without Tantrum. And we're gonna talk about the original taper and I'm gonna quote Mr. Mohammed El Arian, and this comes from the Frontline episode number five of the 2021 season, The Power of the Fed. That was posted on the 13th of July, 2021. Here is Mr. El Arian to introduce us to the taper tantrum. I was on the trade floor. I remember Chairman Bernanke saying that he would taper. First, we had to figure out, what does taper mean? And the minute people realize what taper meant, which is that the Fed would step back from buying all these securities, and even though the Fed said it was going to be gradual, it's going to be measured, the markets had a massive tantrum. And now here comes a newsreader voice, Jeff. The market selling off after Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke said that the central bank would start tapering its economic stimulus measures later this year. Now we go to Richard Fisher. The markets went into a fit. They became dysfunctional. It was known as the taper tantrum. A new newsreader voice, Jeff. Well, we all know it. 
When Ben Bernanke talks the F and the Federal Reserve speaks, markets listen. Taper tantrum. Back to El Arian. Markets are like little kids. They want candy, and the minute you try to take the candy away, they have a tantrum. <laughs> Dive in, Jeff. Dive in. <laughs> It's ridiculous, isn't it? It's can you kiss ass any harder than that? I don't know. I mean, it's just well, let's st okay. What happened in May of, of 2013? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about late May of 2013. Ben Bernanke shows up in Congress and says, he never says the word taper. He says, we may step back or scale down the pace of our purchases if the economy continues along the path that we it seems to be, which was. The economy continuing along the path was the, the unemployment rate dropping more quickly than anybody or any Fed model had anticipated. So there's really two parts here, and everybody kind of flew into the second, the first part of it, which is the actual taper itself, which meant the Fed was going to be buying fewer bonds at a reduced pace, so that by you know at, at some uh, some point in time in the future, they wouldn't be buying any bonds anymore. Oh God, the horror! They, the Fed would no longer be buying bonds, and without the Fed. What would interest rates do? Because nobody wants treasuries, obviously. If the only reason anybody wants treasuries is because they can sell them to the Fed. And that's so it reinforced the 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 underlying message ever since QE1 that interest rates are all about what the Federal Reserve does. And of course, none of that was actually true. What actually happened in May of 2020 or May of 2013 was that the market agreed with Ben Bernanke's assessment of the economy. And it said, well, if the Fed is seeing it, and the Fed is modeling the economic improvement, maybe there's something to it. And so interest rates rose, not because the market was afraid that nobody was going to buy all these treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, but because the market started to think maybe there's some inflation and growth potential after all. I mean, if these idiots at the Fed see it, then maybe that's actually real. Maybe this time, this time for the first time, we're actually going to see some legitimate economic recovery potential. It wasn't a huge possibility, but when you go from no possibility of recovery to a small possibility of recovery, the end result is what looked like a taper tantrum. But in reality, it was really the, the market starting to move toward a normal stance. And really, as we've said over and over again, interest rates should rise. We should welcome and celebrate interest rates, not talk about routes and markets dysfunctions or anything. What happened in the second half of 2013 was a good thing. If it had continued, it was the market saying, Yes, Ben, we see this improvement in the economy, the same thing that you see, and we agree with your taper assessment. We're going to sell off. The interest, nominal interest rates are going to rise and real rates were going to rise because the market was assessing the same thing, which was a little bit more growth and inflation potential. It had nothing to do with the Fed's pace of bond purchases. It was all about looking at the economy and coming to the same conclusion. 114 years ago or so, not Wixell, quote, the rate of interest is never high or low in itself, but only in relation to the profit which people can make with the money in their hands. And this, of course, varies. In good times, when trade is brisk, the rate of profit is high, and what is of great consequence is generally expected to remain high. In periods of depression, it is low and expected to remain low. The rate of interest on money follows, no doubt, the same course. The interest rate fallacy, the tantrum, was good news like you said the market was agreeing we've got because especially we went from qe infinity remember bernanke the first couple were like well we're going to do this much qe this much qe and then qe three or four ish they said well we're just going to do it forever a few months later they said i, I think it looks better what a change from forever to you know what it's getting better yeah. and of course things improved seemingly interest rates went up for a while before eventually exactly. turning Not very down long though, right Emil? <laughs> you know it's that's one of the things too i think we need to focus more on the end of the taper, taper tantrum than the beginning but you know we do need to understand what started it and what the tantrum actually was it wasn't a tantrum at all you could actually call it a celebration the market yes said, yes hallelujah yes this actually worked and what, what wixel was saying is again going back you know as emil just pointed out the interest rate fallacy look when times are good you can make money in the real economy you don't need to own safe liquid instruments like u.s treasuries 
gold. So if you think things are going to be good in the real economy, you sell your U.S. treasuries and start lending money or doing things, financing projects in the real economy. So rates should rise when things are good. So it wasn't a tantrum at all. The only reason people call it a tantrum is because we're supposed to put the Fed in the middle of our worldview. And when the Fed in the middle of our worldview, they think, okay, everything is about the Fed. And so if interest rates rise, that must be because the Fed is not bought, not buying as much bonds. When in reality, it was something completely, completely, completely different. And the way the quote unquote tantrum ended has as much to do with everything as the way it actually began. There's another reason why we call it a tantrum. It's the condescension towards markets by the elites, highly educated people that uh, it's a really lead. Good point, Emil. You, right? I mean, it's much like democracy, like Mr. Churchill said, you know, markets are just the worst. They're terrible. They're unforgiving. They can, they can fall into bubbles. They're terrible, but they're the best thing we've got. We're on earth. We're not in heaven. They're, you know, good leading indicators and the markets should be trusted, but they weren't because we were, cons you know, the El Arian was considering them spoiled children who have to be at the utter of the Federal Reserve, because you know no one else buys these. All right, enough about yeah, twenty. Well, well markets—they're—they're okay, they're not perfect. No. And so yes, you can criticize. They're messy. They make a lot of their mistakes. It's not. A, we don't believe in efficient markets like they. Do. Some other people do. But you're right. There's this idea that hey, we need to have a centralized technocratic institution at the controls. Otherwise, markets are going to create all sorts of messes. And that supposedly this top-down centralized approach is a far better way than the decentralized, destructured markets, which, I mean, just from an information filter standpoint is ridiculous because the markets can filter far more information, far more efficiently than any top-down centralized approach. And then, you know, we get, off, we get off track here with, you know, what the Fed actually does with psychological manipulation and expectations policy, which is really the point is, you know, they don't trust the marketplace and therefore they're trying to manipulate market as well as public opinion based on what they think should be happening and what they think should be happening is entirely backward right they want interest rates to go low when it, throughout history low interest rates have signaled the opposite of what they intend to accomplish so honestly i think all of these people would have been better served if they had embraced the taper tantrum in 2013 and said look we're right because the markets agree with me. Of course, now doing that, it would have been a disaster because the markets only agreed with them for a couple months. <laughs> you know, it didn't really last. And then the markets again turned against everyone, which is another important point because, you know, interest rates began to fall throughout 2014, even as the Fed was buying fewer bonds, which completely totally refuted the idea the market was market markets only concern was how many bonds the Fed was buying. It's really, as, as Wixel had said, and as Mill just pointed out, it's all about our interest rates relatively high or relatively low. And if they're relatively low and going lower, it's not a tantrum. It wasn't a tantrum in the first place. It was a short-lived short -lived party, fiesta, celebration that, hey, maybe, maybe Ben Bernanke hit upon something with QE3 and 4. Oh, no, he didn't. We keep saying markets as an aside here, but for any new listeners when we think of markets we are not thinking yeah. of equity the stock last markets. thing we think about is the no. stock market <laughs> euro dollar futures sovereign bonds the inner workings of the monetary order that's... dollars exchange value i mean that's a good thank I mean, you while the while that 2013 taper tantrum was going on especially toward the fall you know when we get into september and october the dollars exchange value started to rise which of course was we're told to interpret that in the in the in the uh, through the lens of the Federal Reserve and oh higher rates mean that's bad for emerging markets and no it was the emergence of the third euro dollar shortage which was already starting to remind the markets that hey <laughs> this 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 taper tantrum celebration things are getting better no they're really not there's really some things going on underneath the surface that maybe nobody else uh, appreciates certainly the Federal Reserve obviously doesn't appreciate and those are the things that are going to that are going to set the agenda moving forward as they did you know that that that, that small rise in the dollars exchange value the, the fact that t-bill rates continued to fall and stay near zero and were were suspiciously low there was all sorts of these these deflationary signals uh, going on while the tapered tantrum was also going on that said 
this is this 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 uh, short lived opti- this burst of optimism just isn't going to last very long at all. And of course, it didn't. So point number one, the mainstream media sets the Fed atop a pedestal and adores them. Point number two, the media mislabeled what had happened in 2013. Tantrum wasn't tantrum. It was celebration. Now we come up to present day, and I'm going to read a quote from the blog post we're still on. Quote by, this is by Jeff. Jay Powell's Fed, even after committing a set of seriously unforced errors just a few years ago, is more and more committing itself to do this all over again. And of course, again, August 16th is when I'm reading from here. Assigning inappropriately huge interpretive value to recent U.S. labor market data, the FOMC is, right now, preparing the public for eventual taper. But this is where the similarities to 2013 end. No tantrum anywhere in sight. This isn't because the market doesn't believe Powell's group will do what they're now more openly hinting. Oh no, it's because the market doesn't believe in what Powell believes. There will be no tantrum even if there is a taper. Jeff, do you have access to a time machine? Are you a warlock? Are you a medium? How can you tell the future? What are today's lottery numbers? Yeah, really. I mean, no, it's it's actually really simple. Once you orient yourself outside of the Fed centered worldview and start to understand interest rates as what they're actually telling you, the market was signaling all along that no, there was going to be no tantrum. And why? Again, the reason why go back to what we said in 2013. If Ben Bernanke and the bond market were on the same page about what was driving taper, which was supposedly the rapidly improving economy, then you get a tantrum, the tantrum that isn't a tantrum. Nominal rates rise as everybody celebrates the fact that this stuff seems to be working. Okay, that's what would happen in a tantrum. Now, as we've been talking about, you and I, Emil, for ever since Fedwire in February 25th of this year, or February 24th of this year, there's been a whole lot of just a, a series of things going wrong, minor things, not the, there, you know, we're not talking about crisis yet. We're talking about a series of minor deflationary things going wrong and bond yields sinking pretty substantially ever since then. So we have a prolonged period of falling yields. What the market is saying is we don't care what Jay Powell's doing. We don't agree with him. He thinks that the labor market, the establishment survey payroll reports are indicative of a rapidly proving economy. And maybe they are for the not for the time being, but the market is saying, even if that's true, it's not gonna last. So even if Jay Powell does taper, it won't matter because we don't think the economy is all that great to begin with. And we certainly don't believe the economy is going to be even better down the road. In fact, we think it's gonna be slightly worse. So no tantrum. And the reason there is no tantrum is because the bond market is disagreeing with Powell's assessment of the economy. It has nothing to do with how many bonds the, the Fed's going to buy. It's all about Newt Wicksell, interest rate fallacy, Milton Friedman, low rates are a sign that money is tight, that the economy is not going to be experiencing growth and inflation. We don't care about Jay Powell because they get it wrong all the time anyway. No tantrum. Okay, those first two articles were from before the taper announcement. Now we're going to the day of, August 27th, Friday. This one's at Alhambra Investments again at the blog, and it's titled, The Fed's True Love, He Tapers Me, He Tapers Me Not. Jeff, before we talk about the scale of the tantrum or celebration or lack of anything, let's talk about why the Fed did this what reasons did they give and there's two big ones inflation and employment which you were just talking about right now i'm gonna pull up here a little article by the wall street journal that was on the 29th so a couple of days later by nick timier ross here's the title wall street journal fed faces new challenge spelling out employment goals federal reserve officials are talking more about how to define a fuzzy concept maximum employment that will heavily influence their thinking around how much longer to keep interest rates near zero. We're clearly on a path to a very strong labor market with high participation, low unemployment, high employment, wages moving up across the spectrum, said Mr. Powell last month. Several Fed officials, including Fed Vice Chairman Richard Clarita, have said they think the U.S. could reach maximum employment by next year. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, a former Fed chair, 
has a similar forecast. Jeff, maximum employment, the Federal Reserve. Yeah, it rings a bell, doesn't it? I, th I remember something about maximum employment in the Federal Reserve, maybe around August of last year, a year ago, there's something, yeah, something came out. And, you know, Jeff, it that, may have been exactly a year ago, the 27th. It was. Yeah, it was the anniversary, Hole, I think. Yep, Jackson Hole of 2020. But before I get that, let's 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 clear up one thing first. What the Fed is doing and what we're talking about has nothing whatsoever to do with recent CPI and PCE deflator numbers. Let's be honest about that. The Fed is still saying quite correctly that what we've seen so far in, in consumer prices is transitory. They continue to believe that, as do I. I think the market continues to believe that. And as we've spelled out in recent episodes, um, CPI numbers and PC deflator numbers, not just in the US, but around the world, have been coming down just as we expected. And that the, uh, the consumer price deviation trend of 2021 looks to be exhausting itself right on schedule. So this isn't really about past CPIs. This is about the potential future CPIs. And in the Federal Reserve monetary policy regime and strategy, it's all about the labor market. They're still operating on some, some bastardized construction of the Phillips curve, which says at maximum employment, you're gonna get inflationary pressures that are sustainable. And that's really what inflation is. It's a sustained rise in consumer prices. Now where it gets tricky is because last year, they struck the idea of maximum employment from their strategy document. They said after their experience from 2015 forward that misled them into all sorts of big, bad mistakes about inflation and, you know, you know, especially in 2018 and 2019, they would no longer try to define maximum employment because it didn't seem like it was possible. At least for them, it wasn't possible. So they took their strategy document away and said, We'll just we'll just get rid of the idea of maximum employment because we don't really know what it is. I mean, maybe it's because the Phillips curve is flattened out. Maybe it's because the you know structural R star no, uh, R star factors that have reduced that. Kind of, we don't really know. Of course, we know what it is. The bond market has told us about tight money ever since August of 2007. But the Federal Reserve is never going to admit that, so they continue to look at other things. But that really makes it for makes it kind of uncomfortable if you're Jay Powell or Janet Yellen or whoever else from the Fed who now in, a year later in August of 2021 is trying to tell to, to sell the public on paper based on maximum employment. Wait a minute, <laughs> you guys got rid of it a year ago, just a year ago. Here's a little bit more from the Wall Street Journal. To reinforce its new approach last year, the Fed laid out three tests that would need to be met before raising rates. First, inflation would need to rise to 2%. Second, inflation would need to be expected to run moderately above 2%. Third, the labor market would need to approach conditions consistent with maximum employment. It's, I don't know, it seems a little circular to me. They're, but, no, Neil, they're just throwing shit at the wall and hoping something sticks, right? What they're saying is, well, before we thought once the unemployment rate got down to where we believe maximum employment was, we would expect to see inflationary pressures. And that's really why in 2017, 2018, and then uh, at the, to the end of 2018, Yellen and then J. J. Powell were aggressively hawkish because the unemployment rate was falling rapidly. In fact, it was falling below, way below levels that they all believed was consistent with maximum employment. And so they're, after having that happen and then that failing to lead to the inflationary outcomes they predicted, you know, because they don't see it was the fourth euro dollar event because they think monetary monetary policy is all about bank reserves and manipulation and things like that, they couldn't reconcile the lack of inflation with the unemployment rate, which is really easy to do when you look at the participation problem. But you know, when you're in the Federal Reserve and you don't know what the hell's going on, you kind of lead yourself into the, all of these kinds of blind alleys, one after another after another. So in late 2018, as this was, as this their whole, you know, Jay Powell's whole thing was falling apart, as you know, the Euro dollar squeeze really started to bite and inflation and potential and bond rates and everything began to fall again, the Fed said, all right, we need to go back and take a look at our what we think of inflation, where it comes from. We're going to do this exhaustive review. We're going to hold, what was it? I, you remember the number? Fed like meets. 20, yes, Fed meets with the public. I mean, they went through this 18-month exhaustive, or supposedly exhaustive review that basically came up with, they threw their hands up and said, we don't really understand what goes on in inflation. And so because of that, because inflation is still one of their two congressional mandates, their statutory mandates, they said, we got to come up with something. 
So as Emil, you just pointed out, it just kind of, I mean, let's come up with a couple tests that are just not really tests, right? Well, inflation's got to get back up to 2%. That's the first prerequisite. And then number two is inflation expectations have to be up, which is, a, I mean, what inflation, are we talking about market-based inflation expectations, surveyed inflation expectations, modeled? I mean, it's, it's all open-ended language for a reason because of discretionary monetary policy, which is what happens with monetary policy with no money in it. It's simply a bunch of central bankers getting together around a table and being complete, com completely confused by all these blind alleys they're forced into by their own worldview that inappropriately puts the central bank in the middle of everything when everything that we've just been saying says don't ever do that. Pay attention to markets, even though they're messy, the markets can steer you at least in the right direction. Participation problem, you said it a minute ago, and they bring it up here in this Wall Street Journal article again. but. It's, uh, it's, this one always hurts me, Jeff, but I'm going to read it out here. Mr. Powell said earlier this year the economy should be able to return to the unemployment rates that prevailed before the crisis, but he has shied away recently from suggesting that the U.S. can also return to the labor force participation rates it achieved before the crisis. Several Fed officials have cautioned in recent weeks that it may be difficult to return to pre-pandemic labor market conditions. Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan in a recent interview said he thinks the U.S. has, quote, lost somewhere between four or four and a half million workers due to retirements or increased caregiving demands. Quote, that has tightened the workforce faster than the headliner <laughs> numbers would suggest. So he kind of backs into it. Jeff, I'm going yeah, to show that has tightened thing. You know, that's I mean, again, <laughs> only economists can get this backwards, right? A yeah, lower participation being... rate is supposed to mean higher tightness in the labor market when it's exactly the opposite. In fact, it was Janet Yellen in 2014 who kind of scratched her head and said, you know, maybe this this lack of participation is hidden slack, not tightness, but hidden slack. As in maybe all of these workers who dropped out of the labor force are actually do want a job. It's just they, they know they can't find one, so they stop looking for work. And we can explain it any number of ways. And the Federal Reserve and economists have tried ever since 2008 and saying, oh, Americans are lazy, they're drug addicted, they don't want to go back to school. Bull. The American labor force knows the score in a way that the Federal Reserve does not. They know the economy has been bad all this time. They didn't drop out of the labor force because they were lazy. They dropped out of the labor force and took drugs because the labor, the labor market itself has never recovered since 2008. And then along comes 2020, which simply makes an already bad situation that's more than a decade old into a worse situation. And so if as much hidden slack as there had been before 2020, there's now more of it, not less of it, there's more of it. And I think that's the reason why Powell doesn't want to talk about the participation rate I think he has an inkling or notion that maybe what the, Mr. Kaplan said probably is the more optimistic interpretation, hmm. when a more realistic interpretation would be, this is not inflationary at all. This is deflationary because we've now, we've now amplified the level of slack, the hidden slack, as Janet Yellen called it, in the economy. And that's really kind of where the bond market's position is coming from, too, not just in the U.S., but across the rest of the world. It looks at the current situation, with, including the U.S., and says there might have been a, a, a significantly more labor market destruction, permanent destruction, than anybody seems to have anticipated. So Mr. Powell and the FOMC are going to look at the establishment survey payroll figures, and they're going to extrapolate that in a straight line forward and say the labor market's going to be tight next year. We need to start tapering. We need to think about rising interest rates. When the bond market is looking at the participation rate, as well as the economic rates of growth around the rest of the world, were just simply atrocious and saying, you go right ahead, Jay, you go right ahead, FOMC, you guys taper and raise rates. It isn't going to make a damn bit of difference because things are not nearly as good as you seem to think they are. The world, especially the world economy, does not look anything like the recent establishment survey payroll reports. It looks, in fact, quite ugly. And if you look outside of the establishment survey and the unemployment rate, you even look at just the participation rate in the United States, which hasn't budged since last October. We've had almost an entire year with the labor force participation rate really stuck despite these massive payroll gains, which are indicating something very, very different 
than what, what uh, is driving Jay Powell and FOMC toward taper. Earlier, you mentioned that the average Joe, average Susie Q knows more about the economy than the, uh, the economists. And we absolutely, Jeff, have to go over that article blog post you wrote about the NBC survey. We've got to do that. We'll do it on Friday, okay? I can't wait to do that one. Absolutely. That one is fantastic. Okay. But I pulled up, Jeff, tell me, I guess I can be melodramatic sometimes. <laughs> I, this might be it. But Jeff, is there a more important socioeconomic geopolitical chart in the world, if you were to pick one, than this one, where we see the labor force participation rate completely detached since the 2008 crisis from the unemployment rate? And the people are on that thick blue line, unhappy, unsettled, but the leaders are looking at the thin orange line, which is rising up. Well, which is what you've been talking about. Exactly. And they're trying to rationalize how the orange line must be their version of reality and how that rea that version of reality must be the true one. Disturbing. And as we know, you know, look at look at how fast it was rising in 2013. It's inverted. But you look at how fast the unemployment rate was was falling in 2013, which fooled Ben Bernanke and then Janet Yellen into tapering and ending QE3. Not that not that that made any difference. We don't care about QEs. QEs are just what the Fed does. But they, they followed the orange line into essentially being blind to the growing disaster that was 2015 and 2016. Same thing again in 2018 and 2019. Jay Powell, Janet Yellen and Jay Powell followed the unemployment rate into you know historically low territory, yet it didn't lead to the growth and in inflation that was supposed to. And you would think these people would stop and really take a look and say, what did we do wrong here? What do we keep doing wrong? But instead, here we are in 2021, and they're going to make the exact same mistake. The only difference this time compared to 2013 and a little bit in 2018 is that the market completely flat out does not agree with their economic assessment. If anything, the market is betting against it. The bond market is saying we see rising deflationary potential. We don't care about the CPIs. We don't care about the establishment survey. We're looking forward into less, the later part of this year and next year. And we're not seeing the same things that the Fed model is seeing, which is, you know, since the Fed models are consistently consistently wrong time and time again, that's usually a good bet to make. So the Fed is tapering in the bond market. We don't agree with it. Flat out, no tantrum. Great segue, Jeff, to your article on the 27th of August. As Fed focuses on taper, it's about to get a lot more interesting in bills. We're going to talk about what the market is saying, the bond market. Before we do, let's go to the Wall Street Journal. On the 29th, August, Sunday, Sam Goldfarb, the title, Treasury Demand Shows Resilience as Fed Signals Bond Buying Pullback. <laughs> and, and Shocking. Rest... It's, oh my God, who could have ever thought? <laughs> it's, it's, well, I'm sorry, me... it's just no, it's no, comical. It's, good. it's really comical. Investors keep buying U.S. Treasury securities, defying predictions for a broad sell-off that would send bond yields back to their March highs. Many Wall Street analysts and investors continue to argue that yields are bound to rise based on surging U.S. inflation, a still solid economic outlook, and, approaching, and the approaching reduction in central bank bond purchases. But the market but it, it, so Mil, far. Just to stop you, isn't that yes. isn't that you know why doesn't somebody you know what is why doesn't the light bulb go off right? We think the economy is right. We think the economy is solid and getting better. We think inflation is, is high and it's going to continue to be high. We think we think we think. Oh, and the bond market is going to eventually agree with us. Why doesn't anybody stop and say, hey, bond market's been right about more than, it's, than it hasn't, and it's not agreeing with our assessment right now. Maybe we should go back and take a second look at our assessment. Maybe we're wrong. Maybe we should stop saying the bond market's wrong and maybe think, it, could, it, could it be us? Maybe, are we the bad guys here? Especially because we have an example, a fantastic example that comes up every few years of the bond market, the U.S. bond market being right. Inversion, predicting recession since the 80s or even going back further. So we know the bond market has this fantastic predictive uh, reputation, 
but yes, the media doesn't. Well, here, let me read a couple <laughs> no, it's, more it's lines. Central bank and their economists and their models are always right, especially when they're wrong. But then they also acknowledged. Well, the bond market's pre- – but then you're right. Then they write um, – Oh, the, well, the bond- yields are going to rise eventually. So the, the bond market's late to the party. It's going to agree with us down the road when – why would that be? The bond market is already forward-looking. Why would the bond market suddenly say, oh, gee, you know, you guys were right. We were wrong We were wrong there for a couple of days. We, forgive us. We, we've, 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 we've got we've, – We've got our we've we've captured our head and we've we finally got our thoughts straight and we agree with you economists. Yes, we were wrong. We're really sorry. Yields are going to fly upward because of tapering. And now that I think about it, I remember that when the uh, the yield curve did invert, uh, there were all these stories about why it didn't matter yeah, this time. So never mind. Market, okay. You know, it's it's ridiculous. And see, that's the thing. It's it's an ideology. It's a cult. It's a religion. Whatever you want to call it, it's not science because science. What is science in, in the monetary, monetary, real monetary economics? We have to look at these market signals, data, and all sorts of other things that we look. We spend our time on Eurodollar University looking at, and say this is the evidence that we have. And if the evidence doesn't match up with your theory, your theory is wrong. But yet, time and again, economists and central bankers and the financial media are all lockstep in saying, "Well, no, yes, we see that the evidence tells us that we're wrong, but." Let's let's give you all these ridiculous reasons why the evidence can't be right and the evidence isn't really evidence. You know, it's, it's how do we fool ourselves into believing what we want to believe anyway? Here's a clue from the Wall Street Journal. But the market so far hasn't cooperated, reflecting continuing demand from around the globe. Now, Ooh, there's, here's, a, there's the money quote, right? Yes. From around the globe, right? That's Here's, another another one of those factors that, you know, one of these days they'll figure out and, and just be shocked at the fact that we're talking about a global monetary system. Here's some more grasping at straws. Even now, many think that the tide is about to turn, partly just because of the change in seasons. As <laughs> traders return from summer vacations and children return to school, encouraging some parents to re-enter the job market. Yields could also rise when new cases of COVID-19 start to fall, some analysts say, noting how the recent resurgence of cases has weighed on investors' sentiment and sent them searching for safer assets. It's all plausible, you know, Jeff? It's all plausible, but that's why we do the show, because we've been documenting that, you know, you look scratch beneath. This isn't about COVID. This isn't about, you know, it's... We've been talking about this again since February, late yes. February. This is not something that just showed up last month with, you know, the Delta panic and all the, the pandemic rising in people's minds. Yeah, that's made a bad situation worse. But let's be honest that the situation wasn't good before all of that hit. And it wasn't just the U.S. Treasury yields, right? We've been talking about global bond yields moving almost in lockstep, near lockstep fashion, a few outliers like Germany. But by and large, the, the global bond yields have been for the last more than six months now, six months, half a year, have been more and more pessimistic deflationary potential, rising deflationary potential globally for half a year. And so, you know, you can say taper, oh, the bond market's going to um, the bond market's going to finally agree with us. But why? Why? Why are things suddenly going to change in the near future? And what are those things that are going to change the bond market's mind that the bond market hasn't already assessed negatively? You know, it's just, as you say, it's, you know, seasons. I mean, come on. It's just grasping at the thinnest of straws. Well, yeah, spoiler alert here, but the yield on the benchmark 10-year note settled on Friday at 1.311, down from 1.342. No tantrums so far. Jeff. Did anybody, for, hey, Emil, do you, uh, off, off the top of your head, did anybody get Muhammad El Arian's comment on Friday? Because the spoiled I children seem to you know, not care about their candy. Well, they've been well behaved. They've been sent to time out, I guess. I don't know. They're yeah, that's well why we're now. having the tantrum because apparently the market doesn't seem to want to, and uh, it, it must be it, it's you and I are going to have to do it for everybody else. Well, Jeff, you tweeted about it. You said that it's because Fed's announcement, even though it was taper, very hawkish, he presented it softly in a in a in a felt glove, <laughs> this iron fist of dovishness, and therefore bond markets are like, yeah, okay, I can live with this. That was the uh, sort of the other grasping at straw. The other straw that they, the media pulled out was, oh, 
well, this didn't turn out like May 2013, so must have been that Jay Powell learned and messaged his his tapering uh, his tapering release, for lack of a better term. He must have messaged it properly this time, prepared the markets so that they would they would receive his comments as a dovish signal. And it's really this need to put the, the Federal Reserve at the center of the universe as, as if controlling all interest rates is just pathological at this point. Because what, what Jay Powell actually said, what anybody's actually been saying up the last couple of weeks leading up to this is exactly the same thing. I mean, exactly the same thing Ben Bernanke had said in May of 2013. What Ben Bernanke, all he really said was, if the economy continues to prove like it looks like it is, we're gonna start reducing our pace of purchases. What has everybody said recently? And Jay Powell actually said on Friday, if the economy continues to prove, we're gonna reduce our pace of purchases. And again, the differences in the bond markets as reaction to both of those statements is all about the bond market, not about the Fed. Jeff, the other bonus here for our audience is that you gave something of a heads up, a little bit of a, hmm, be on the lookout for this in this article where you try to alert us to a similar pattern that's developing right now that we saw previously in previous euro dollar events that you wanted to raise to our attention can you talk to us about bill supply cash management bills and the debt ceiling deadline and what we saw in uh, previous versions of this reflationary cycle it's kind of strange how it always seems to come up right at the edge of inflation just before these dollar shortages really get, get weird. And 2013 is a perfect example where you have these debt ceiling negotiations which cause you know, the, the, the Treasury Department to start to alter the way it, it, it funds the federal government's deficits and its debt. In 2011, maybe even a better example where the Treasury Department really began to restrict bill supply which caused it, it certainly caused a bad situation to become worse because, you know, we always talk about repo and repo collateral and the availability. You know, when the Treasury Department issues fewer bills, that means there are fewer bills, which are the best of the best of the best collateral available for the repo market and the derivatives markets too, because all these markets are collateralized. And what that means is in healthy normal times, what we'd expect to see is fewer bills or fewer treasury or fewer whatever, fewer collateral supply. We would expect dealers to expand their balance sheet, expand their money dealer capacities, start to reuse and repledge these treasury securities more and more to make up for the lack of supply. So you have sort of like a, a sort of a, um, a, a, a sort of a spring type of mechanism that uh, cushions the blow from lack of supply so that dealers are offsetting the reduction in supply to make sure that the, the overall find the overall funding environment is, is essentially the same as it was no matter what Treasury is doing. But what we see time and again is that in you know, 2011, a very good example, the Treasury reduced supply and dealers did not rush to offset it because they were becoming more and more risk averse. So you saw Treasury bills fall, as we talked about in a previous episode, we went through that. Treasury bills were falling, even though CPIs were through the roof and everybody was, you know, the mainstream assessment was that it was inflationary recovery building up into 2011 when there were all these deflationary signals and bills, which were being made worse by Treasury and its debt ceiling, uh, debt ceiling issue, reduce, reducing the supply of bills. And as we move closer to the debt ceiling again in 2021, you know, Janet Yellen is curtailing bill supply just like she has done before, which is causing all sorts of weird things to begin to happen, which we've talked about many of them before, you know, bill, bill yields falling below the RRP where they shouldn't be auctions prices way below the RRP, uh, all of these sorts of indications that say, yeah, you know, Treasury is reducing the supply of bills, but the dealers are not making up for it with their higher levels of reuse and repledging a higher collateral multiplier across the rest of the system. And now we're starting to see some of the bills act weirdly as we get closer to the debt ceiling, uh, the debt ceiling deadline itself, like the eight week bill is starting to creep upward in, in yield which can cause all sorts of problems too, because if you start to get price sensitivity in the treasury bills, which there's a reason why treasury bills are the best of the best of the best is because they're mostly price insensitive, or at least you know inflation insensitive. There's not really a whole lot of price movement in them, at least not unpredictable price movements that you know any kind of volatility in the bills can, can lead to much bigger problems than strictly you know, just lack of supply. This whole debt ceiling issue reminds me of those slasher movies, the sequels, when 
you don't know what's going to happen in the movie, right? But this is the fifth Friday the 13th you've seen. And you know it's not a good idea for that one guy or girl to say, hey, we're going to go walk around the woods right now. It just raises the hairs on the back of your neck. And so, like you said, we're not saying anything's going to happen, but we've seen this movie in pr different forms previously. And uh, we'll be on the lookout and report if we see any other shocks on our shadow money-o-meter, if, uh, if some warning's coming. I guess, Jeff, we are heading towards that low, the seasonal low in mid-September. So it's uh, autumn. It looks like it'll be, you know, it's concerning. or so We have to keep our eye on it, basically not what the Fed is saying. Right, and it's you know you know seasonality. We're talking about seasonality after uh, after rebuking the Wall Street Journal for doing the same thing. But no, there's the seasonality is actually a legitimate seasonality that comes up time and time again. That's one thing to keep in mind. But you know, going back to 2013's debt ceiling, and you know there was actually a government shutdown at that time, if you remember. Um, you know, it didn't cause everything to just fall apart the next day. But it played a definite role in turning reflation into the shortest in the bond market, one of the shortest reflations on record, simply because it was another negative deflationary potential. You know, another thing that dealers do not want to have to deal with in otherwise an overwhelming list of things they don't want to have to deal with. It's one more it's one more straw to pile onto the camel and eventually the hmm. camel just can't go any further. Right. And so in 2013, it wasn't the debt ceiling that caused the crisis the next day. You know, it took a while, but that was definitely, it was a negative deflationary pressure that absolutely played a role in ending reflation number two and starting and getting and making Euro dollar number three into one of the worst, ones, especially for uh, other places around the world. It was a contributory factor. So what we're keeping an eye on here isn't necessarily, oh, we're going to have a, you know, a global crisis in October, but maybe this is, you know, one of the yes. things the market's concerned about that. You know, reflation, if this is reflation number four, maybe this is sort of its last gasp that the the Treasury supply and the debt ceiling, everything that's going on now will just simply be one more negative factor too much. And that what the market's seeing ahead of us isn't financial crisis, but at least moving into the direction of what would be euro dollar number five. And the potential for that is probably much higher, certainly much higher than anybody at the Federal Reserve would would, would uh, model and appreciate because they don't look at any of this stuff anyway. Nor would Janet Yellen because for the Treasury Department's, you know, people ask all the time, why isn't the Treasury Department doing something about? It? Surely they know about this collateral issue, don't they? And the answer is no. And and even if they did, they probably wouldn't do anything anyway because it's not their job. And let's face it, bureaucracies only care about what their specific job is. So it's not like the Jet, Janet Yellen and Treasury Department is going to start issuing bills based upon collateral factors. Though they probably will once the debt ceiling uh, the debt ceiling gets moved and the Treasury is free to start uh, uh, borrowing again like it wants to. But again, you know, as as in 2013, as in 2011, it's not really the debt ceiling. It's it's causing these dealers to have to adjust to their positions and their operations and their money dealing activities. That creates these negative factors that linger on even after the t-bill issue gets fixed well we'll be measuring and mapping thank you keith mccullough what's happening in the monetary shadows and reporting it all back to you dear audience you can follow jeff at jeff snyder underscore aip on twitter you can find me at emil kalinowski jeff i will talk to you later this week Thank you very much. And it was great to get this tantrum out of the way because, you know, if, if we didn't do it, I think people would be waiting for somebody, you know, they're waiting for the market to have a tantrum and I, they might have to wait a long time.